I'd like to introduce Tristan Walker today, who will be speaking on the development of a climate resilience and adaptation plan. Please join me in welcoming Tristan to the Good afternoon, everybody. It's awesome to see so many smiling faces in the room. My name is Tristan Walker. I work with the Town and Municipal District of Pincher Creek. Uh, originally, I was brought into the position through the Energy Management Program uh, put on by the Municipal Climate Change Action Centre, where the goal was to reduce uh, energy costs, reduce emissions within municipal facilities. And so through that, I got to kind of get anything that had relation to climate change put under my, uh, my responsibilities. And so one of those projects ended up being this climate adaptation and resiliency plan. And so this was a plan that was funded 100% by the Municipal Climate Change Action Centre. And we did it in partnership with the town uh, uh, and the Municipal District of Pinter Creek, as well as the Bagani Nation. We engaged with All One Sky Foundation, who was a consultant, uh, as well as the Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative out of the University of Regina and the Resiliency Institute, which is a uh, charity. The goal of this plan was to prioritize the climate risks that were facing the town of Pincher Creek, acknowledging that even without climate change, we are still seeing things today that are putting the infrastructure, the citizens, and the health of the people at risk within the town and municipal district of Pincher Creek. Moving into the future, we understand that this is potentially going to change, and it's our responsibility as a municipal district and a town to get ahead of that and understand what the potential changes are so that we can be prepared for them as they come. In saying that, the deliverable from this study was a climate adaptation action plan to address and prioritize climate risks and how we can adapt to them into the future. Now, before we get started here, I just want to clarify the difference between mitigation and adaptation. So mitigation efforts are trying to reduce the impacts or the, the, the things that will cause climate change. So whether that is greenhouse gas emissions, whether that is uh, forest fires and all that sort of thing, um, that is all on the mitigation side. And this plan focuses specifically on adaptation, which is understanding that the climate is as it is today and is potentially going to change, how do we as a society, as a government, and as citizens respond to that and adapt so that those risks that are in place are going to have less of an impact on us? So that was the focus on the right side there of this study. Oh, there we go. I think, yeah. So, Within the study, it was broken down into four key phases. We started in October 2022 uh, to develop this plan, and the first phase was to do the research and background information. So this involved looking at all of the plans, uh, the policies, the bylaws, the, the state of our infrastructure that already exists within the town and municipal district of Pinter Creek. Phase two, which started in December, uh, involved climate modeling. So this is where the Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative came in. We brought them in and they did climate models of the municipal district and they were able to do them down to 25 square kilometer uh, squares basically within the municipal district and identify how the climate would change based on a variety of variables when the world hits three degrees of warming. And the way they did this was they looked at the history of the area and the variables that were associated with what happened to the climate and then they projected that into the future based on what they were seeing and what the projections would potentially be. The second part of that phase two was a community survey. So throughout this entire process it was very important to us to understand what our community felt were the risks, where they were worried about what would happen with climate change, where they were worried now. And so throughout that survey uh, we did our best to respond or to engage with all of the stakeholders within our community. Phase three started in February 2023, and that was a climate risk assessment 
the climate projections report, so Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative released their report, and then a community open house. And so that community open house, uh, we brought or invited community stakeholders uh, to come to the table and to look at the risk assessment that we had done based on the results of the survey and the climate risk assessment that was done with uh, stakeholders throughout the, uh, the municipal district and the town. So this included municipal staff, uh, charitable organizations that worked within the area on land use, uh, government organizations, as well as just general community members that we did this risk assessment. And then finally, we did an action planning session and the final climate adaptation plan, which included a, a takeaway brochure that we try and make available at both the town and municipal district office for residents and stakeholders to, to take away and understand what the highlights of that plan were without having to read the 150 pages. So a little bit of background on our community engagement. We had 211 valid responses from our survey. Uh, we felt that it was correlated well with the statistics that we had of the population within the town and municipal district. Um, we did find that there were a lot of robots that responded. However, uh, we didn't include those ones because we felt it would skew the statistics a little bit. Um, it provided us a lot of insights into potential risks and really helped to guide where we were going to do the, the, the risk analysis and the impact measurement of those risks. Um, because people get, had the opportunity to include what they thought would be the risks and we used that to inform the work that was done in following. The picture on the right there is an open house that we held on April 13th to present and discuss these climate risks that we had and then provide an opportunity for the community to come up with adaptation measures. So understanding that there is a lot of skill sets within the community, a lot of deep knowledge um, that could potentially offer up adaptation measures that we wouldn't have thought of. And so by being able to bring out all of these people to, to put their heads together and to collaborate, to come up with ideas, I, it was able to add depth to our adaptation plan that, that wouldn't have been possible without it. And so we were really happy to have about 40 people come out for that and uh, engage in a three hour session. Uh, we had poster boards set up around that analyze all of the different risks and offered people an opportunity to discuss and write down and all that sort of thing. Now, these climate projections. And so this map on the left is an example of the uh, changes in number of hot days that we're gonna see when the world hits a three degree warming difference. And so we made these maps for a variety of different factors. We looked at spring precipitation, at summer precipitation, winter precipitation, the number of frost free days that we're gonna be seeing, uh, the number of hot days, the number of very hot days, this can all be found uh, on our MD of Pincher Creek website. Um, I won't go into too much detail about all of the different kinds, but it, it really is quite astounding how the Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative was able to narrow down what we would see within the municipal district of Pincher Creek. So as you can see on the left side, where we have all our mountains, we're not seeing a very high increase in the amount of hot days. But as we get more east throughout the municipal district, we get to an increase of 27 days above 30 degrees Celsius in the municipal district. So the town is kind of in the, the middle right corner there. I don't know if I can get my mouse to show. No, oh, there we go. So town's right here. So that's gonna see about an increase of 20, 22 days uh, that are hot. And we were able to do this for, for every different profile. So we were able to see where we're gonna get concentrated uh, precipitation, where we're going to get that reduction in frost-free days, where we're going to get that uh, increase in heat. And so this allows us to guide what kind of risks we see and, and associate that with where the population centers are, where the infrastructure is, um, and, and where the high value land is. And to note, this is probably estimated to happen about 2070. Obviously with these projections, there, there's a lot of variability and it's like trying to guess the stock market, you can never be right. Um, but at least it gives us a, a platform to, to try and develop some information from whatever that's gonna look like. The next thing we did was an economic analysis. So we took into account all of the infrastructure, all of the health impacts, all of the land values that were in the town and municipal district, 
and we tried to estimate what the impact of climate change would be on all these factors. And so as we can see in these donut charts at the bottom, by 2055, we're gonna see a change in value of about $18 million in the impacts of climate change. So things like wind events that are gonna knock down power lines, things like health effects of heat and smoke um, that are gonna overrun our hospitals, things like um, increased cooling costs, but we'll also see a decrease in heating costs, right? So, so some, sometimes there's value. The other thing that we saw was it an increase in agricultural land value. And so this is an interesting one because the way these are modeled is they do a distribution curve. And so they look at a whole year's worth of precipitation. So when they see that, we would get an increase in annual precipitation. However, we're gonna get a decrease in the summer precipitation. So we're gonna get some extended droughts in the summer. These models don't take that into effect. So when they say we're gonna get an increase in agricultural land value, they're assuming we're gonna get uniform precipitation over the whole year. Realistically, if we're getting droughts throughout the summer, that land value probably isn't gonna be as high as projected, right? So like I said, these aren't 100% accurate. They're probably not gonna happen and they need to be taken with a grain of salt, but they give us an idea. And so by 2085, we're seeing a change in value of about $33 million uh, in the effects of climate change. And one of the big reasons for doing an economic analysis like this is it allows us to create the uh, investment profile of the adaptation measures. So if we don't have an idea of how much things are going to cost, how are we supposed to justify spending money on things to stop those, right? And that's where this really comes into help. And so generally with adaptation measures, we're seeing an investment payback of four to five to one. So for every dollar you spend, you're going to see a savings of four or five dollars. And so that's allowed us to justify hopefully putting some more budget towards a lot of these measures in the coming years. Looking at our climate risk assessment, so going into acknowledging where all of our citizens through the survey uh, thought there would be risks, where there's classical risk um, that's already been identified, such as wildfires and droughts and water shortage and all that kind of thing, what you do is you take a likelihood score. So the likelihood that it's going to happen. When you come to uh, an overland flood, that's not very likely in Pigeon Creek. But when you multiply it by your consequence score, the consequence of the creek itself flooding is very high, right? You lose a lot of land value, you can lose properties, you can lose people's livelihoods. And so that gives us our overall risk. And that's how we did the, uh, the, the initial baseline assessment to identify what the top risks in the area are. And those risks are shown here. So on the left side, we have the, the unlikely things. So you can see up in the top left, the river and creek flooding, the overland flooding, more possible are wildfires and droughts, and then almost certain we see wildfire smoke. Even this year, it was awful, right? Last year, it was pretty bad. That's not gonna change. We see the extreme heat and loss of winter recreation. So as we get those lack of frost-free days, the people that come sledding uh, in the Pitcher Creek region, right? They're not gonna be able to access the sledding terrain because the valley bottoms aren't gonna have snow. We're not gonna see that cross-country skiing access anymore. Castle Mountain's gonna have to spend more money on snow making because there's not gonna be enough snow at the base of the hill for the amount of days that they need in order to operate at a profit. And so all of these things are, or the, the ones in the orange are, are what we identified as our top risks in the area. So to go over those again, we have river and creek flooding, wildfire, drought, water shortage, extreme heat, loss of winter recreation, and wildfire smoke. The rest of them were identified as risks. However, for the purpose of this, we had to uh, narrow it down a little bit for the adaptation measures um, so that our scope wasn't so big that we're trying to tackle every single problem that exists. We're, we're gonna try and get the ones that are gonna have the most impact and are the most likely. So again, those are priority climate impacts. And these categories, uh, so health and well-being, disaster resilience, infrastructure, parks, environment, and econ economy, are what the United Nations uses to categorize their climate risks. And so what we tried to do was come up with adaptation measures that would fit into each one of these uh, categories so that we could structure and scope these projects 
to be associated with things like grant funding that's going to come out, with things like um, infrastructure planning and municipal development plans. And if we can have those structured in this way, it makes it a lot easier to separate them out and to access um, support when needed. So the vision for us is to create a, re a region that is safe and resilient to all, for all to enjoy responsibly. So to give you a little bit of background on some of the actions that we uh, determined to be options. So within the health and well-being, so support community gardening was a big thing. Give people access. Uh, this is not only a health benefit, but it also allows for food security. So in times of drought and high food costs, that there's a small area within town that people can grow their own food or grow their own food on their own properties. The next would be to install outdoor water features. So this helps with the, um, the extreme heat events. Obviously, when you have a drought, um, outdoor water features probably aren't the, the best thing to do. And so that there's going to have to be some kind of control measure in place when you decide to, to operate those or not. But for example, we have a great pathway that goes down the middle of Pitcher Creek. And if we were able to install water fountains and that sort of thing, it keeps people hydrated, allows them to still get outside in those extreme heat events uh, in the shaded areas um, and stay healthy in doing so. Then we have upgrades to our spray park. So we have an awesome spray park right now. Um, it's somewhere kids really like to come hang out in the summertime. But it's not that accessible to other segments of the population, whether that be uh, your teenagers, your, your adults, or your seniors. And so the idea of this would be to increase the accessibility of that, uh, that spray park by adding some shade structures and potentially some other activities for other people within our, our population to, to enjoy. We also have purchasing temporary shade structures and installing permanent shade structures. Obviously for these, um, in those extreme heat events, you want to be able to go find somewhere that's shady, but stay outside, right? Get that fresh air, get be healthy, uh, but not be in the direct heat. And then, of course, adjust recreation programming during extreme heat and smoke events. So try and bring people back inside, offer them things to do inside where it's a filtered, cool air. Next, we have a, a nice laundry list here for disaster resilience. I'll go through these ones a little bit quicker, but the one at the top is update the land use bylaws to enhance flood protection. And so the Alberta government's done a, a great job in doing flood mapping. Um, and it, it's something that I think is important to incorporate within all our bylaws. And it's something that exists already. However, we have a disaster, uh, sorry, a, an emergency management organization within Pincher Creek. And what they're doing is working with the municipalities to, to upgrade the recommendations within those bylaws. Next here would be uh, heat and smoke alert response plans. So supporting our community in helping them be aware of when it's dangerous to be outside because of smoke and heat and what to do in those cases. So whether that's go to a, a cooling center, um, things to do to your own house, kind of access and egress to different areas and all that sort of thing. And that's something that our emergency management organization is also working on. We also have a, a homeowner climate change vulnerability assessment kit. And so this, the, the goal of this is to give homeowners a, basically a checklist or, or a little game where they can play and they can understand how vulnerable their own property is to climate change. Whether they're on a creek, whether they have air conditioning or not, what kind of filtration they have, the insulation on their properties, um, if they have a lot of built up infrastructure within uh, tree areas with a lot of downed uh, brush and that sort of thing you're going to be at an increased wildfire risk. So giving people an opportunity to do the assessment themselves without having to go to each house individually. And then on that note, giving them the opportunity and the information for what they should do to respond to that. Uh, a couple other ones here, we have a drought response plan, and that's something, I don't know how familiar everyone is with Pitcher Creek, but currently our fresh water intakes are above water. Um, so we're trucking water every day, uh, which is a large cost and it's not resilient. So being able to come up with a plan that's going to respond to these sort of activities or, or prepare for them in the future so that we're not having to scramble to, to make sure that our citizens have water. We also see uh, research to understand future wind patterns. As I'm sure you're all aware, the wind around this area uh, can be quite extreme. And so understanding if we're going to get 
more extreme wind, or if it's going to die down and become calmer or more level uh, as we see climate change into the future. Obviously, this is something that we don't know at this point, um, and would be probably we engage with another research organization to, to do a study on, on what that would look like. We also have uh, develop a, fan, a plan for enhanced fire department response capabilities, update legislation with fire smart provisions, conduct forest fuel management treatments and vegetation management, and then retrofit designated emergency reception centers. And all of these uh, are, are work that can be done by various organizations. At Castle Mountain, for example, we have a, a group of landowners that are going out and doing fuel management on their own properties and throughout the Castle Valley because they understand the risk that Castle Mountain is at for wildfires. If something comes into that valley, a lot of those houses are, are surrounded by trees that there's nowhere really for the fire to stop at this point. So the recognition by not only the governments, but by the people that live in the areas in what they can do it is very important for a lot of these items. We have our parks and natural environment actions. So developing a natural asset inventory and management plan. This allows us to understand what our natural assets are, what the value they provide are, and how we should deal with them moving forward. If we should increase some, if some are okay to remove for development purposes, um, and, and all that sort of thing. Develop a water sharing agreement between the town and MD. Obviously, that would help mitigate uh, some of the things that we're seeing right now, where the MD does not have any fresh water unless they're trucking it. Also, a, a water source protection plan. Um, the Old Man Watershed is currently working a lot on, on headwaters protection and that sort of thing, so supporting them in, in coming up with a protection plan because at the end of the day, all the water that falls or melts in the Pinchot Creek area will end up either in the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, or the Arctic Ocean. So whatever happens in the headwaters is going to affect everywhere else. Develop a water conservation efficiency and productivity plan. So this would be, again, to help the residents in understanding how they can save water within their own facilities, how they can collect water using things like rain barrels, and, and, and the effects those will have on the overall water utility within the area. Uh, again, get into the water bylaw for improved water pricing structure so that we can eval evaluate the water that's used and, and make sure that people are understanding what that value is and not just letting it brush over their head and doesn't matter. Enhanced support for watershed planning and protection. So that's similar to the source water protection plan. Uh, this would be more in supporting the, the organizations that develop that sort of material. And then we have a tree planting program, enhanced irrigation infrastructure, and enhanced environmental monitoring. On the monitoring side, the more that we can understand, um, the more that we can respond and act early so that we can be ahead of things. Last one here, I think, is the economy actions. So provide climate resilient education material to farmers and ranchers so that they can understand how their products and actions are, are going to be affected by a potentially changing climate into the future. Develop a tourism and recreation master plan. Um, the Highway 3 corridor has been identified as an area for tourism um, growth by both the government of Canada and Alberta. And so it's, it's on the municipalities to understand that and be prepared for the growth of tourism in the area so that it's not going to affect us or our, our environment. Improve accessibility to outdoor recreation, and finally enhance marketing to the Pinchot Creek region. With our infrastructure actions, uh, so develop a climate resilient procurement policy, research climate resilient building materials and infrastructure in support of anything that the municipal district or town does, but also for our residents. Upgrade our municipal buildings to provide better protection from extreme heat, so this is improved uh, air conditioning as well as uh, improved uh, building envelope and then flood mitigation infrastructure and the potential for uh, solar panels to reduce evaporation from the reservoir at the town. And the last slide here is the, the importance of implementation. So everything can be planned and that plan is very easy to just put on a shelf and forget about. So within this, a uh, couple of the recommendations that were identified in order to make sure that 
these items get implemented are a dedicated staff time, commitment to annual funding, and monitoring and evaluating. So every couple of years going back, looking at the plan and seeing what we've done. I'd like to thank you for your time today and would welcome any questions that you have. We'll move into the questions and answers. I, there are some thank yous that I would like to pass on. Um, first of all, thank you to LSCO for the donating the room. We can help them by buying food out when we come to our meeting. I thank the University of Lethbridge, Shaw, or Rogers TV, um, the Lethbridge Herald for uh, their coverage when they provide it, and most of all, thank you for coming out today. We appreciate your attendance. The next week's speaker is Markham Hislop on unethical oil and gas, Alberta's shameful secret. So we'll begin the question and answer uh, period. You mentioned these. Uh, that was on the other side of the page. I couldn't turn it fast enough. <laughs> in, uh, in on your table, there is the uh, change or folding bill jar. We would appreciate your contribution to SACWA. And you can also purchase memberships uh, for uh, our organization. So we'll begin with the questions and answer period. I will uh, uh, ask the speakers to line up on this side and uh, we'll turn it back over to, to Tristan in a moment. Please keep your questions short and brief and we, we uh, uh, we'll get through the questions that you do have. Thank you. Hi Tristan, my name is Henning Wendell and uh, where you end it, I guess my question could lead into another whole uh, session, because yes, you basically provided all develop, 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 develop. Okay, now implementation. So my question is sort of twofold: What kind of time frame is forecast for the implementation of various aspects? And secondly, what are the sources of funding? <coughs> Very good question. Um, so to answer the first part, the, the time frame on the sort of implementation of these things ranges depending on uh, the, the scale, obviously, of the implementation measure and um, how critical it is to get it done. So within our, our report, we, we ranged it from about two to 10 years in, in getting some of these things done. And if you'd like to read more about that, um, you can access the report itself and it'll outline how those numbers kind of came up. Where the funding's coming from. So like I mentioned, we're seeing payback anywhere from four to five to one uh, for dollars spent versus dollars saved. And one of the interesting things is we're seeing insurance companies getting into investing in adaptation because they're the ones at the end of the day that are on the hook for any of the destruction that happens due to climate events. And so if they can spend four to five dollars up front and save 15 to 20 in the future, that's a really good investment for them. The other places we're seeing investment, uh, that the government of Canada has put multiple billions of dollars uh, into climate adaptation funding over the next couple of years, I believe out to 2028. And that's probably something that we're going to see uh, recapitalized at, at the end of that because like the insurance companies, oftentimes the, the federal government is who has to come in and fit, foot the bill when a lot of these damages happen because the, the organizations, whether that be the municipalities or the private companies, don't have the, the underlying capital to, to be able to rebuild in, in these situations. So, great question and uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Tom Moffat. Thanks, uh, Tristan, for uh, your presentation. Uh, it's very informative. I was wondering um, if uh, the uh, infrastructure side of things, you had taken a look at uh, the municipal electrical grid at all, because I know one of the big adaptation things is uh, people talk about electrifying everything, you know, uh, get way more electrical appliances in your house, you have to upgrade your uh, 
connection to the grid, and that's not always possible um, given the infrastructure available and that if you throw in electric cars and other things. Uh, so did you guys uh, get a chance to take a look at that at all? That's a, a very good point. Um, and I should have made the preface before this. So this was focused on action items that the town and municipal district could undertake themselves. So when it comes to the, the electrical grid, that is uh, more on the side of the Fortis, the ATCOs, the Alta Links. So that wasn't something that was addressed within the scope of this project, but it's definitely something that is worth looking into. And I think that's the, the responsibility of those organizations like your Fortis and your ATCO in, in looking into the resilience of those things down the line. Um, yeah, I can speak a, a little bit to the resiliency. We, we did incorporate the costs of climate disaster to some of the infrastructure within our area, so power lines and all that sort of thing, but we didn't incorporate any of the, the transition to electrification or anything like that on, on what the impacts would be, um, just because that, that wasn't, that's not within the jurisdiction of what the MD in town can control, so good question. Christian, uh, thank you for your presentation. A lot of detail there to absorb. Um, if you gave background on this uh, question, then I missed it. But uh, your your projections seem based on an increase in temperature of 3%. Uh, I'm not a climate expert, but I had the impression that was on the high side. I wonder, you want to say more about where the background to that 3% figure? And, and what timeline? The name. Hmm? The name. You know with me. No, no, my name is Terry Shillington. <laughs> Your name is Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Um, yeah, so the, the line we set was three degrees of warming, um, and that's worldwide. And that's generally an accepted figure within research spaces for, for what the baseline to, to put that climate projections on. Um, it, it is something. I don't know if we can say it's on the high side. It's definitely something that we could potentially never see. Um, but like the stock market, you, you kind of have to set a baseline somewhere and, and understand what the achievability is. And so we're already looking at, we've already passed basically a degree of warming from our baseline. And so the, the three degrees is projected to happen about 2060 to 2080, if we don't do anything. And that, that's one of the big considerations in this is this is assuming that nothing gets done. None of these adaptation measures get done. We're not mitigating any climate change, anything like that. And so, so that's where that's coming from. Um, was there another part of your question that I missed? Sorry. No, you answered it. Awesome. Well, Linda Carlson, thank you for the presentation. It gave me a lot to think about. But when we see these sort of plans, they often don't include that wild card factor. For example, the modeling I've seen is we're still livable, we get warmer, as long as we can keep our water, um, we are still livable. But there's going to be a lot of places around the world that aren't. And I never see things like migration factored into these sort of plans. Because with the migration patterns we're seeing, a place like us that's livable is a lot of people are going to move here. So did you consider that at all in your plans? And have you ever seen that kind of wild card figured into these type of plans? Because it's going to dramatically affect our communities. Awesome question. Um, it's something that we considered at the outset of the plan, but one of the considerations with this is you can really let that scope grow as big as you want. Um, and so we had to kind of draw a line somewhere. And so we ended up not including things like changing food sources or immigration and that sort of thing, just because it, it's not local to our area per se. Of course, if people come and we change what kind of food we're growing in our supply, it's going to end up being local. But within these projections, it's very hard to, to quantify that, right? Because it, it could be such a different range. And so absolutely, you're right. It could have a major effect on our areas. But within that effect, we're still going to see all of these things that were listed here as critical regardless of whether we get immigration or not. And so the, the idea was um, that, that we're going to focus on things that, that are going to be related to the, the climate change specifically in the area, as opposed to climate change in other regions. 
because of course we're going to see that difference in other regions, but we don't have the capacity to model out where is going to be livable and how much of those people are going to come into the, the Pincher Creek area. So I think on a on a United Nations scale, on a, on a federal scale, that's definitely something that, that needs to be considered, and I think it is. Um, but within our, our municipal district and the town, it, it's not something that was included within the scope of this project. Thanks, I'm uh, Trevor Page, and uh, thanks for your presentation. And congrats to Pincher Creek and to all of those with you that have done this study. Really good to see this kind of work is being done. It's needed worldwide. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate a little more on, on the economic side of things uh, in relation to your projections, particularly on agriculture and, uh, and climate adaptive crops. What do you see, uh, how do you see farmers switching in the area in the years ahead. Thank you. Another great question. They were kidding when they said everyone would know what they're talking about here. Um, yeah, so as one of the adaptation measures that we identified was trying to provide that information to farmers and ranchers on what we're seeing as the change is happening and what can be those value add crops. And so when it comes to this, it's, of course, a, a farmer is going to primarily do what they're good at and do what makes money, right? So if they can do what they're good at for as long as possible, that's what they're gonna do. And then if they start to see other crops making money, they're gonna try and make that transition. So what our responsibility is, is to try and give them the information on what we think is going to be that crop that makes money in the future and how they can adapt their operations to be able to be, uh, maybe not as profitable, but as break even as possible um, and, and minimize any losses. So as we continue down this road, it's going to be something that we work with the ag producers, with the seed operators, uh, with, with the ag controllers in the different organizations and provincial legislation and all that sort of thing to, to try and stay ahead of it and understand where um, the, the value is going to be for them. At this point, I'm, I'm not somebody who, who has a background in agriculture, so I can't tell you what it is, but we are working with different organizations to investigate where that's going to go and what that's going to be. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. My name is Mary Shillington. Um, I, kudos to your to Pitcher Creek in the area that you took on this project. And I'm wondering where the, how, how did the spark move along in order to do that? And are other uh, towns and municipalities getting interested in your, your study and, and finding out more information so they can do it too? So those are my questions. So the, the driving flat factor between, holy moly, <laughs> the driving factor for doing this study uh, was from the Municipal Climate Change Action Center who, who put together a funding program to offer 100% funding for municipalities to undertake these kind of studies. And so that was identified within our municipality uh, last July. And so we started on the process of figuring out what that study would take and then obviously applying to the, the funding stream. Uh, for your, your second question there, there, there are quite a few municipalities that also undertook a similar study with the, through that funding stream. Um, and we have received a lot of feedback and questions about it for people to, to understand what we did and, and how they can integrate that into theirs. Uh, most notably, the Alberta Municipalities Organization um, proposed to take this study to the Canadian Pavilion at COP28. And so unfortunately, we, we didn't get selected for that presentation, but um, it's definitely gaining a little bit of national attention. Sure. Thanks, Christian. I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, as a part-time uh, resident of your area, um, I've got two questions. One is, 
um, the Kakani Nation, how did they <coughs> respond to this and partake in it? Because sometimes they're outsiders. And in the last five years, they begin to do a lot of the farming themselves. And that's been a huge change. My second question is, you've had water resources where you're really low this year. <laughs> and I can remember when the Old Man River Dam was almost ready to flow over. And I have an uncle who built dams all over the world. And he told me it was the biggest discharge he'd ever seen. <laughs> because it was there at the time. So you have the streams of huge amount of water, little, how does your projections try to adapt to that? <laughs> so for the first question, the Pecani Nation uh, had a representative on our, our project team. Uh, so we met basically every two weeks to discuss uh, results, to, to plan future uh, whether it's community engagement sessions or, or review the, the consultant's work. And so they were directly involved there. And one of the major topics that was continuously brought up is these climate changes don't stop at borders, right? So just because the MD of Pincher Creek is its own entity and the Pagani Nation is their own entity, that doesn't mean that the climate's gonna stop and say, oh, okay, we're not gonna do anything over here. So that was one of the driving factors from, from getting that integration and working together on it. And it's been something that we, we've continuously worked for after the project has been completed to, to do these implementation measures together and find out how we can leverage the both communities together uh, in, in going towards attaining the, these implementations. Um, for your second question, that the the high water levels to the low water levels, and that, that's definitely something that it's a challenge to adapt to because they're completely different aspects, right? So um, it's one thing that if you're, if you're doing adaptation measures for low water levels, you might not see that for 25 years because you're getting high water levels. But when that 25 years happens and you do get the water levels, it, it's important to have the systems already in place and to understand what you're gonna do and vice versa. So, um, Basically, it's just going two completely different opposite directions and making sure that we're prepared for both. Um, because, like you said, that these things are cyclic and we are going to see high water levels again, um, but who knows when that's gonna be. 